Ok, pessoal, já são nove e cinco, né? Acho que a gente pode iniciar. So, um, let's get started, Murad. It's five past nine, right? So we can get going here. Good okay. morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for this uh, first talk in this series of lectures on insect plant pathogen interaction. Uh, these talks are part of the grad school program on the biology of the host parasite interaction at the University of Goiás State in Brazil. And we'll have other talks here, um, another one tomorrow and two other on the 3rd and on the 5th of July as well. So you guys are invi invited as well. And today we have a uh, special guest, Dr. Murad Ganin, uh, who is a senior scientist at the Volcani Center in Israel and adjunct professor of entomology in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, Murad graduated from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and completed a three-year postdoc at Yale University School of Medicine in the USA, um, after which he joined the Department of Entomology at the Volcani Center. His research nowadays focuses on biological and molecular interactions between sexual vectors of plant pathogens including white flies and psyllids uh, with plant pathogenic viruses and bacteria. He's also interested in understanding sexual resistance to pesticides and the development of new and biorational pesticides with the industry and uh, screening for active natural compounds. So Dr. Murad will talk for about 40 to 50 minutes and then we will open the microphone for some questions uh, or you guys can also send us written questions in the chat and uh, then we can do some, we can have some time for discussion as well. We thank Dr. Murad for being with us here today, sharing uh, some of his knowledge and expertise. And Dr. Murad, please uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, I, um... Do you need help for uh, to share your screen? Yes, I, I just click on the... There's a square with uh, an arrow uh, pointing okay. up, and then you click on that and share. Uh, you can share one screen or the whole screen, whenever you think it's easier. Oh, also, uh, I'm going to start to record here. I think it's a good uh, idea to have this record. You, you see now uh, the screen? Yeah, I can see it. Uh, I, I, you, you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Muad and uh, I'm from Volcani Center, as Patricia said, in Israel. Um, and we, uh, we basically focus on uh, uh, pathogen, uh, plant pathogen transmission by insects. And we focus on um, uh, two pathosystems that we uh, currently work on. One is uh, a transmission of uh, plant viruses by white flies. And uh, we mainly focus on Bemisia tabaki uh, white fly, and, uh, uh, which, which is a very important uh, insect pest. As you, some of you know, it's important also in, in Brazil. And it transmits um, hundreds of uh, virus species. In Israel, uh, it has been very important in transmitting uh, Bigomo viruses. Um, and uh, the most important one uh, was actually tomato yellow leaf curl virus or TYLCV. And this is most of the things, most of the works we did were, um, were with TYLCV. Uh, recently, many other viruses uh, came into Israel and we also tried to work on some of them. And we uh, usually uh, basically uh, focus on the interaction between the vector, the insect, and the, and the pathogen, the virus. We do less work with, uh, with plants. So, and we try to understand how those viruses are transmitted and what uh, mechanisms inside the, the insect are involved in the transmission. Now, the other pathosystem we uh, started working on about 10 years ago is uh, um, uh, the transmission of uh, Liberibacter Liberi species uh, by psyllids. And uh, this system is currently present in Israel is the, 
uh, a transmission of a Candida to slavery vector SRM at zero, which is transmitted by the carrot psyllid um, and causes a very important disease in carrots in Israel. Carrots are a very important crop and mostly goes to export to Europe. And um, the disease call, is called carrot yellow, yellowing and, and it basically affects the carrot itself and it's not marketable. And um, we, uh, we try to collaborate also with uh, people or uh, scientists from the uh, nowadays from the US and uh, there you probably heard about uh, citrus greening and it's also uh, caused by uh, uh, another liberobacter species and transmitted by another uh, psyllid species. And, and basically this work started with this system in the US and then uh, we, we, uh, uh, we started working on um, the other system in Israel and now we try to collaborate and look and see uh, what parallels we can learn from both systems uh, regarding the transmission of those bacteria by uh, psyllid species. If, if I have enough time at the end, I will maybe talk a little bit about this system also. Miraz, so, uh, yes. uh, we are seeing your notes there. Maybe you can uh, just, um, uh, I don't know how to, how to say that, or how can you um, take this off? Oh, you mean you see the other? Uh... Yeah. Maybe if you can just um, make it um can someone explain how to do that for him because i don't know how to to change this uh, what do you mean the, notes, the below the, the next slide maybe you can take no notes i'm not sure but oh oh you mean you mean you see the next slide yes exactly oh i think there is a, a way to wait because oh. below the next slide there is no notes maybe if you click it there it's just because he, he didn't write anything yeah uh, guess, yeah um yeah great. good great, great. thanks Mary. Yes. <laughs> okay okay sorry <laughs> okay um uh, so i uh, um uh, basically uh, i i um will focus on i mean i will talk about uh, those systems and i was I was planning to uh, put focus on uh, uh, because we were uh, using a lot of lots of imaging, imaging and uh, microscopy in all of our studies, and I want to basically convince you that imaging and microscopy and uh, using uh, uh, those uh, techniques uh, are not less important than using uh, molecular biology and all the other uh, techniques we know. Um, we so we use all of the molecular biology as well, but as well, but uh, I think uh, uh, involving, uh, involving microscopy and imaging and uh, molecular probes and antibodies is, uh, is basically, we think is a, is a much uh, um, nicer and productive and uh, you know, nicer to the eyes and productive uh, um, approach that can uh, tell you many, many things that you don't see in other techniques. So we, we basically uh, uh, use light microscopy, transmission electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy. Uh, and then recent years, uh, more and more confocal uh, microscopy. And, uh, and, uh, and, and because we do lots of confocal microscopy, we also uh, use many molecular probes, antibodies, and so on. Um, so, so although the, in the title I said imaging and localization of viruses, I, I will uh, put uh, those imaging uh, techniques into context of, of, of the biological systems we, we work with. So I will start with this system of, as I said, transmission of uh, tomato or leaf curl virus with the white flies. And uh, you see in the bottom, this is actually the title of my uh, PhD thesis that I did about more than 20 years ago. And it was titled uh, Studying the Paths of Acquisition and Transmission of Tomato Yellow Leaf Curl Virus and How the Virus Affects the Insect. And because, you know, because we needed to look at the paths of acquisition and transmission, we needed to do a, a, a deeper study on how those uh, white flies compose from the inside. So we basically wanted to look at the internal anatomy of white flies. 
And this paper was the major paper we published that time, uh, looking at the digestive and salivary and reproductive organs of the white fly. And, and the, the, the conclusion of all this paper was it's basically drawn here. Um, uh, when we look inside the white fly, uh, you can see the, uh, the head, the, the white flies usually feed from leaves through the stylet, and the viruses that are taken from the plant are acquired from the phloem by the, sty by the stylets. They reach the, uh, the, the gut, the, the mid gut that you can see here. Patricia, you see the, my um, uh, cursor also, or I need to use um, 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 a pointer? I can see the cursor, yeah. I can see it now. Uh, you see the laser? Uh, it's better, the laser. Good. You, you see it? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, um, so, so the, 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 the idea was to, you know, draw, draw the internal anatomy of the white fly and, and then study how those viruses are transmitted by, by the insect, where those viruses reach and how they cross the, the digestive system, for example. And, and we, we are talking about the TYLCV, the tomatoleucal virus, which is a circulative virus. And a circulative virus means that they are acquired, uh, they reach the digestive system, they uh, cross the digestive system to the, the, to the hemolymph, they go back to the salivary glands, and from there they are uh, secreted outside. And we usually use the aphids as our uh, reference, uh, although aphids, if you look here, um, their digestive system is a bit different than white flies, because it's, their digestive system is linear one. And you can see the foregut, the midgut, the hindgut, they are all one tube. And in the, in the white flies, it's a, it's a bit different. Um, so basically, uh, um, um, uh, one of the first things we started doing is, is uh, doing sections through the white flies. And you can see here this uh, red, uh, red uh, line. And this is basically, uh, and on the right, you can see those sections. And this is basically a section showing uh, the, the two pairs of uh, salivary glands. Uh, the primary salivary glands in the white flies. It was, uh, the, this was the first time we actually could see, uh, you know, uh, organs that are involved in virus transmission by doing only, uh, you know, uh, sections through the white fly. Um, um, next, next one is, uh, you see this uh, line here, the red line, and a section through the, the, the thorax and the abdomen, and you can see how the esophagus is going through the thorax then continuing to the mid gut entering the the, the abdomen and and uh, those were really neat you know photos and we, we're starting more and more uh, you know learning and this is how we learned how the anatomy of this white fly is built from the inside um, now later on we started also dissections and uh, we said if we if we can do sec uh, we do, do section and we can do also dissections and and the, this is how the, the primary salivary gland look like in, in white flies. They are kidney shaped. And you see when, they, when we use different staining uh, techniques, you can see that uh, the glands, they do not stain uh, um, uniformly across the glands. So you can see different regions here. And it turns out later that those different regions also um, have different functions. This is the, uh, the, the mid gut of the white fly. And you can see here the same, uh, the same story with the staining that when we stain, for example, with the toluidane blue, you can see that not, not all the mid gut stains uniformly and there are different regions. And also uh, those different regions are, are assign different functions in the, in the, in the, in the gut and also uh, later on in the transmission. And basically one of the most important uh, areas we uh, found in the gut is basically this area is called the filter chamber. And the filter chamber, we spend long time trying to understand how viruses basically uh, arrive to the filtering chamber, where they are filtered and how they continue across the gut and uh, where basically the food substances also that include the viruses are filtered across this organ uh, where the sugars are secreted and how the viruses are absorbed to the hemolymph. Um, 
so, so this is just to show you that uh, many of these microscopy techniques help us to uh, try and understand the uh, structure of the, the internal anatomy of the white fly and how viruses uh, um, can move across these organs and be transmitted. But then, then later on, when we needed more and more to understand the virus uh, movement and transmission inside the white fly, we needed to develop more and more uh, methods and techniques to uh, see those viruses. And one of the first techniques we surve surveyed a lot of the literature and we tried to develop our own protocols for uh, localization of these viruses. And here on the left, you can see uh, uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization of uh, TYLCV um, inside the gut. And basically, when you look at this uh, image, you, uh, you directly see that most of the virus is basically localized to this area of the filter chamber. And this is why we thought that uh, most of the absorption of the virus occurs in this, in this area here. And you can see when you go along the midgut, the, the concentration of the virus is less and less. Uh, and this is using a fish, and fish is basically a very simple uh, technique of using uh, very short DNA probes that are designed to hybridize with um, <clears throat> a small portion of the genome of the virus. In this case, is the V1 uh, gene, which is the which encodes the coat protein. On the right, you can see immunostaining. It's basically a similar technique, but using, uh, using an antibody against the virus. And this antibody is also against the coat protein of the virus. So you can see that in both cases, you can very nicely see the virus and you can see high amounts of the virus. And you can see also a uh, functional localization because when the, most of the virus is localizing to the filter chamber, um, but we made this assumption that most of the virus is also absorbed to the hemolyph in this area. This is another image showing the immunostaining of TYLCV in the gut, mostly localizing to the filter chamber, and the lower panel is showing the localization in the primary salivary gland. And this is basically also made us think that uh, this, this specific virus is basically transmitted through the primary glands and not the accessory glands as for other viruses, for example, in, in uh, aphids. And uh, same techniques can be used also to localize. This is the localization of the same virus in tomatoes in the phloem, the sieve, uh, sieve elements of the phloem. And you can see that localizes very nicely in the sieve element. Um, and this is where basically uh, white flies feed through their stylets, and this is where they acquire the virus. Um, for transmission. Uh, now, those techniques really were really powerful, and I'm, I'm not showing uh, everything uh, of these studies, but I'm showing, I'm focusing on the, those imaging and um, uh, organ, uh, imaging of the organs, just to show you that uh, those techniques are really powerful in understanding also. Um, uh, what's happening during the transmission. This is a work that we published several years back and, and, and showing uh, the involvement of one protein that we uh, identified using a microarray screen and it's called heat shock protein 70. And we found that uh, this protein basically interacts with the virus, with TYLCV, also in the filter chamber area. If you see the lower uh, right, Panel, you can see that most of the co-localization, which is represented here with yellow, so the, the virus is localized with red. It's, uh, it's, uh, this is immunostaining, as co-immunostaining of HSP70 and the virus, the TYLCV. And you can see in the lower panel that most of the co-localization, which is represented by the yellow color, happens here in the filter chamber. So again, uh, we thought that uh, HSP70 functions in this area here. And later on, we basically uh, found also that HSP70 is part of, of the activation of the immune system against the presence of the virus. Because when we silenced or we inhibited the HSP70, there, were, there was a more increase in the virus transmission. That means in a regular, uh, in a regular situation, HSP70 acts to prevent the virus 
maybe from uh, being transmitted or being uh, you know transported through the gut because again when we silence it uh, you get more transmission of the virus um, this is another uh, uh, work where uh, we identified another protein. It's called cyclophilin. Cyclophilin was also shown to be involved in virus transmission in aphids. And in this case, in, with white flies, we also found that um, um, the, he, this uh, protein was identified in, in a proteomic screen and uh, comparing infected and uninfected white flies. And again, you can see that cyclophilin also localizes. So you can see here a portion of the midgut and the green dots that you see are cyclophilin. And this is also in immunostaining uh, with antibodies. And in red, you see TYLCV, the virus. And when you, when you do the co, uh, the, the, the overlap or the, the merge of the both um, of these uh, photos, you can see that uh, TYLCV mostly co-localizes with cyclophilin in the gut. And the same, the same I, I thing happens also in the salivary glands. So in the lower panel, you can see the salivary gland, the co-localization of both the virus and cyclophilin. And it's more interesting even because you can see that most of the co-localization happens here in the center of the gland. And this is, we know this is the area this is an area called the secretory region of the gland. This is where most of the cells basically empty their content into the uh, salivary duct. And the salivary duct goes to the stylet where uh, saliva is basically secreted outside of the gland. So, so we, we know more or less that the virus interacts with cyclophilin in the gland. Uh, we don't know yet what exactly it functions. We know cyclophilins are chaperones that, that interact with, uh, with uh, many proteins, uh, but we know they interact here. Again, if we uh, silence cyclophilin, it affects very much the transmission of the virus. Now, um, uh, now I want to move on to uh, another aspect of the studies we did and how we also employed these techniques on the, for understanding. Um, and talk a little bit about uh, endosymbionts in white flies. And endosymbionts are bacteria that live inside white flies, and, and they are basically widespread in many, many uh, insect species. And they have diverse functions depending on which, uh, which symbionts they are. This is the life cycle of the white fly. And you see here the female that lays eggs on usually on the lower side of the leaf. And those eggs, they usually hatch to a crawler, and the crawler develops through uh, different uh, nymphal stages. And you can see, if you look carefully on the nymph, and the nymphal stages, you can see those ye two yellow dots here in the in the nymph. And uh, if we look inside these uh, yellow dots, you can you can see that they are full uh, with bacteria. Those dots are called bacteriosomes, and those bacteriosomes basically are transferred vertically from the mother to the offspring through the egg, okay? And those bacteriosomes are full with bacteria, and this bacteria is called Portiera. Portiera is the primary symbiont of white flies, and primary symbionts are very essential for the species. They have to be there, otherwise uh, the insects cannot live. But we distinguish between uh, uh, primary symbionts and secondary symbionts. So the primary symbionts usually complete the diet of their host, and they are they are very important for the uh, species persistence. And now, because white flies and many other sap-sucking insects who, uh, feed on uh, the phloem, they feed mostly on sugars. Sugars, and they they lack many of the uh, essential substances as amino acids. And those symbionts synthesize those amino acids for them. Uh, and that's why they are also housed uh, strictly in those insects. Now, there are also secondary symbionts, which uh, we know there are many species. They've been found in many uh, insect species. And many of them, we don't really know what they do, what their functions are. But they were acquired uh, through evolution uh, within many insect species. In this photo here, you see, uh, this is a, an ovary dissected from a white fly, a female. 
And you can see uh, eggs in different developmental stages. And you can see those yellow uh, dots here, yellow uh, organs. And those yellow organs are basically the bacterial zones that are acquired during the egg development. You can see those mature eggs, the big ones. They, are, they already have those symbionts inside. And you can see this one. This is immature egg that is now acquiring the, the bacteriosome inside. So the bacteriosome will go inside and the egg will develop and it will be laid later on. And this is how they basically take those symbionts with them and they can later on develop. Now in Israel, we did a survey and we looked how, on how those symbionts uh, distributed along, among uh, the two species we have in Israel of white flies. So we have two species. Uh, we used to call them B and Q species. Now they have different names. I will just uh, use B and Q uh, because it's easier. And you can see that they are not evenly distributed. For example, this symbiont, this bacteria called the Miltonella is found only in the B species. Uh, Wolbachia and Arsenophonus are found in the Q. Rickettsia is found in both uh, species. And this is, a, this is a survey done on individual white flies collect, collected in different areas in Israel uh, by PCR. Now, the, the interesting thing uh, we wanted to, to see well, where those symbionts are located. And you can see by using also fish uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization, using specific probes for each of those uh, symbionts, you can see, for example, Hamiltonella is localized inside the bacteriosome uh, with the primary symbiont. So in all these images, the primary symbiont I told you about, Porchiera, is found in all white flies. So you will always see it. And it is uh, uh, localized here with the red color. Uh, Hamiltonella, it's a, a secondary symbiont. It's you can see that it's co-localizing with the primary symbiont. Arsenophonus, for example, is also co-localizing. So they are strictly uh, found inside the bacteriosome. Bulbachia, for example, we found it's mostly inside the bacteriosome, but sometimes you can see some cells outside. Uh, the only the only symbiont we saw it outside of the bacteriosome is rickettsia, and uh, rickettsia is found in all the body cavity, but not inside the bacteriosomes. And this turns out to be a very also interesting uh, uh, bacteria that I will uh, mention later. Now, as I said before, endosymbionts are vertically transmitted. That means they are transferred from the mother to the offspring. And I, as I told you, there are many bacteriosomes inside the hemolymph of the female. The bacteriosomes, this is, the, this is an ovary also dissected from the uh, hemolymph. And you can see here in red are the bacteriosomes uh, after fish experiment where we localize the primary symbiont in red. And we localize rickettsia is the secondary symbiont. Okay, so you can see those bacteriosomes. And you can see that rickettsia is basically not inside the bacteriosome. It's found in the eggs, but not inside. So this, those bacteriosomes, as I told you, they enter the egg. So this is an egg reacted again with, the, uh, with fish. And you can see how the bacteriosome is entering the egg. And later on, when the egg is uh, laid, this bacteriosome moves basically from this area of the pedicel to the center of the egg. And when the egg hatches to the nymphal stage, this bacteriosome is basically divided into two bodies, two bacteriosomes. And later on in the, in the, in the adult, those bacteriosomes, bacteriosomes uh, multiply more and more. And they swim in the hemolymph and when they meet the eggs, the developing eggs, each cell of them will go into the egg and this is how uh, they are transferred to the next generation. As I said, Hamiltonella is a, this is a, this is a, a, a secondary symbiont. As you can see, it's Hamiltonella here is in green. The primary symbiont, uh, Portiera, is in red, and you can see that is strictly co-localizing uh, in the bacteriosome. And you can see uh, nicely, even if you look very closely, you can see that Hamiltonella and Portiera they don't occupy the same niche inside the bacteriosome. They have different uh, areas where they uh, they are found inside this uh, bacteriosome cell. This is another uh, localization of, of Hamiltonella, and you can see 
uh, very nicely how they localize inside, but they localize they don't localize in in the same areas. This is an uh, this is a localization in the abdomen of uh, an adult female. You can see even the eggs here around. Um, now, as I as I mentioned before, when we did this uh, survey of uh, infection with those symbionts uh, in Israel, we we saw that Hamiltonella is basically infecting the B biotype, but not not found in the Q biotype. This this was really interesting because uh, uh, we know from other uh, studies that uh, symbionts might be also involved in virus transmission, and it has been shown also that uh, one of the symbionts in aphids was responsible for efficient transmission of uh, lotio virus by the uh, peach potato aphid. So we did, we did uh, really a, a large study that took uh, several years with the several students. And uh, I'm showing you, showing you here just a conclusion of this uh, study where we basically did, uh, uh, we, did we tried to determine what if symbionts and white flies are involved in virus transmission and which of those symbionts is really involved in transmission. And we found that Hamiltonella, the, this, um, this secondary symbiont, which, is, which I said is co-localizing with the primary symbiont in, in bacteriosomes, is basically involved in virus transmission and it determines the efficient transmission of TYLCV by white flies in Israel. So when we did transmission experiments, you can see that all the B biotype or all the B species white flies can efficiently transmit the virus, while the Q are uh, uh, not really uh, good vectors for the virus. And uh, those B biotype species, you can see they are infected. This one is infected with Hamiltonella rickettsia. This one only with Hamiltonella. The Q biotype populations are infected with Arsenophonus or Wolbachia but no Hamiltonella in the Q biotype. So, and you can see, uh, we did later on many other experiments to show that uh, basically a specific protein from this Hamiltonella interacts with the virus and it aids the virus in the, its movement in the white fly. So this is uh, the whole story and uh, really very short. And if you are interested, you can uh, go to this paper from 2010 and, and see really, uh, um, uh, the whole uh, the whole thing we did. Um, now the model we uh, work on uh, we work with in, in Israel and we know it's uh, it uh, also happens in reality is that when white flies acquire TYLCV it moves across the gut it goes to the hemolymph and in the hemolymph it interacts with uh, this protein here that you see in green. This protein is called a uh, grow EL and uh, this interaction basically uh, saves the virus from uh, attacked by the immune system of the, the white flies. Because if we uh, somehow inhibit this groil, the virus won't really survive in the, in the hemolymph. So they move as a complex to the salivary glands. Here the virus is released and then enters the salivary gland and then it, uh, it is uh, uh, entering the salivary duct into the, the, the stylet and this is how it is uh, transferred uh, to the next gland. And this, is, this really happens in reality. We know in Israel that when we have, uh, 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 this is, this is, a, this is a, a greenhouse, which has, uh, we can see tomatoes and uh, white fly populations that were tested here, were all B biotype. And this, this uh, greenhouse was all infected with TYLCV after some time. Uh, on the contrary, if you see on the right, this greenhouse, for example, has eggplants and tomatoes. And you, you, we, we, we could see it was heavily uh, uh, treated with pesticides. And we here, we found only Q biotype and we, uh, none of these plant, tomato plants were infected with TYLCV. And you know, in Israel, if there are white flies, there should have this virus, unless there are a different, it's not, not B, uh, only Q. Now we know that Q is also very resistant. So if there are pesticide sprays, then we have a Q biotype, but we don't have virus. So, so, and this is really known in Israel, wherever we have a virus ep epidemic of, of TYLCV, we know it's a, it's a B population. Now the other, um, the other uh, uh, 
uh, into symbiont I showed you before is a rickettsia, and I told you this was one of the interesting uh, um, uh, symbionts we work with because uh, it's not co-localizing with the primary symbiont in, in the in the in the bacteriosome. So you see here the bacteria. This is a fish again, fish experiment where you can see the bacteriosomes in red, in uh, containing the Portiera, the primary symbiont, and in blue here, you see rickettsia. So you can see rickettsia cells all over the body, but not inside, uh, and, and this is a nymph, uh, nymphal stage. Now, one of the interesting questions we really were interested in, since rickettsia is not found in the bacteriosome, how it is transferred uh, from one generation to another. Uh, because if we maintain a, a white fly population with rickettsia, it will be it will keep it will be infected, and the rickettsia will be transferred from one generation to another. But we know it's not inside the bacteriosome. So we did a, a study that was uh, was also published, and we basically followed the uh, presence of rickettsia using fish, using uh, you know other uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy techniques, and. Uh, we could basically show that rickettsia infects the eggs during development. So rickettsia is found in the hemolymph. It enters the eggs that you can see here. So rickettsia here is labeled with the green. And you can see even at the level of the single cell of rickettsia, they are found everywhere in the, in the, in the ovaries. And when the ovary uh, develops, uh, rickettsia cells uh, enter the cells. And this is how they are basically infecting the next generation. It's, uh, so it, this is called the transovarial transmission uh, of the symbiont, but it's not, it's not, it's vertical transmission, but it's not through the bacteriosome. It's by infecting the uh, developing uh, ovaries uh, inside the female. Now, one, one of the uh, really interesting and, and uh, um, uh, observation we made, uh, Lately is, uh, so here you can see um, uh, with rickettsia, here you can see two uh, images of rickettsia localization in the female, in the, in the white fly adults. And on the right, you can see rickettsia infecting the whole body cavity of the white fly. So in red, you see the primary symbiont and in blue, you see rickettsia. But on the left, the difference is that this white fly is infected with TYLCD. So the difference here that you can see that the uninfected white fly is uh, infected with rickettsia all over. The, 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 and the infected white fly with TYLCV, rickettsia is somehow uh, concentrating around the bacteriosomes. And we don't really uh, have a good explanation why this happens, but we can see from other images, you can see here the same thing. This is an infected white fly with rickettsia. And you can see all those bacterial zones in red the, with the portiera. And you can see rickettsia in blue. And you can see how rickettsia cells are really concentrating around the bacteriosome and trying to uh, somehow maybe enter the bacteriosome. We don't know. But you, we can see the same thing here. You can see it very nicely in here. This is a uh, TEM images and you can see how many rickettsia cells are around the bacteriosome here. Inside the bacteriosome in this, this is a B biotype and it has portiera, those are portiera cells and Hamiltonella cells inside the bacteriosome or rickettsia cells around. So we don't know why rickettsia cells are really, uh, when the white flies are infected with TYLCV are uh, concentrating around the bacteriosome, but this is a phenomena that uh, we always uh, see in infected white flies. Now, as I told you before, rickettsia, when we started this work, rickettsia infects both uh, white fly species, B and Q, but you see that rickettsia is not infecting 100% of the individuals. So there are some individuals that are not infected with rickettsia. And this was uh, good for us because we could establish uh, you know, populations uh, 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 infected with rickettsia and populations that were not infected with rickettsia. We basically take individual white flies, we uh, give them to lay eggs, then we test if they are infected or not, then we 
uh, combine all the infected and old and non-infected ones. And this is how we established uh, rickettsia infected and uninfected uh, populations. And those are basically the, those are basically the populations we use uh, uh, to see how rickettsia can affect the white fly. And we, we really uh, uh, tested many uh, biological parameters and we saw that rickettsia have different effects on the biology and development and even on pesticide resistance. So uh, there is a, a, a response to pesticides. So uh, if you have white fly populations in the field, one of the nice things to see or to test if they are infected with those symbionts or not. Uh, so this is the, un, the infected population. This is the un uninfected population. And you can see a big difference in the amounts of uh, rickettsia that are found everywhere in the body. Now, if we, if we look at the, the gut of the, of the white fly, and we see that rickettsia is also infecting very heavily the gut. So this is a gut uh, with the fish experiment localizing uh, rickettsia. So this is using a specific probe for rickettsia. And you can see that all this red are rickettsia cells. So rickettsia is found everywhere in all gut cells. And if you remember this gut I showed you before, this is infected with, uh, or this is after uh, DYFCB acquisition. And one of the questions we really asked if, whether there, are, if there is any interaction between rickettsia and DYFCB in the gut. Because if they both found in the same cell, uh, there might be uh, you know, any kind of interaction happening there. And here, uh, when we did the many, uh, fish experiments looking at the uh, rickettsia and TYLCV in, in guts. Uh, one of the uh, things that we noticed is whenever you have a, a, a heavy infection with rickettsia, you have less uh, virus in the gut. So the, the, here you see two guts. One is rickettsia infected and one is rickettsia uninfected. And here we are localizing the virus. So TYLCV is in red. So this one is infected with the virus, but not infected with rickettsia. And this one is infected with rickettsia, but no virus, okay? And, and, and you can see here, the, this, is, uh, this is the same image, but now showing rickettsia. So you can see high amounts of rickettsia, less virus in the gut. And here you see high amounts of the virus, less rickettsia, okay? Or no rickettsia. So, uh, so the, the, one of the conclusions was that there is uh, some antagonistic relationships between rickettsia and TYLCV uh, uh, in the gut. Now, the, the other one of the other the other interesting things we uh, uh, we we see, and we're still working on this uh, issue this issue of uh, rickettsia and involvement in virus transmission. Uh, if we compare rickettsia uh, uh, uninfected and rickettsia infected populations, and uh, and re retention of the virus, you can see that when we have rickettsia in the white fly, there is better retention of the virus in the, in the so this is a, again, fish experiment showing uh, TYLCV and showing rickettsia. So when we have rickettsia, we have more virus inside the white fly, okay? And when we have, we don't have rickettsia, we have less virus. So this is uh, not as the same, the previous experiment I showed you here, just, just looking at retention, okay? And uh, uh, regarding retention, we know if we do exp an exp retention experiment where we do acquisition, then we look at the amounts of the virus in the white flies, you can see that, and this is a time course, 24 hours, six days, uh, two weeks, and three weeks. You can see in that in the rickettsia uninfected white flies, uh, uh, the virus is retained less in the insect. So the presence of rickettsia has to do something with the virus retention in the white fly. And this is also uh, 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 can be seen in the transmission experiment. When we do transmission with rickettsia infected and uninfected uh, uh, white flies, you can see that uh, the rickettsia infected ones are, are better transmitter or better vectors for the virus than the rickettsia uninfected. It's almost double uh, uh, the amount of transmission by rickettsia infected. Again, this is uh, this has a very important implication in the field. If a population is infected with rickettsia, it will be 
uh, better population in transmitting the virus. And the last thing um, I want to show you regarding rickettsia, yeah, this is not related much to the previous one, but uh, one of the observations we made when we looked at rickettsia and the white fly is that rickettsia was also found. So those are the two pairs of uh, uh, the, the pair the pair of the primary salivary glands from the white fly. And when we did the fish experiment, we could see also rickettsia inside the glands. So if, if rickettsia is found inside the gland, then uh, one of the ideas was to see, the, was to test whether rickettsia is also secreted into the plant. And this was really the case. If you, we do fish experiment of on rickettsia, using rickettsia probes inside the plant, you can see that it's found in the flowing. So rickettsia is basically entering the glands and then secreted into the plant uh, when the white flies are feeding on the plant. This is rickettsia localization in the in the stylet uh, of the white fly. Now we we don't we don't think rickettsia infects the plant. We 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 know that it is uh, injected into the plant, but we uh, we know that it's not surviving much into the plant. So it's not a plant pathogen. It's a, is a as an individual symbiontin white fly, but uh, it is injected into the plant when the white fly is feeding. Uh, from the flowing. We don't know if it has any effects on the plant. We never tested that, but uh, you can see that it's really found also in the flowing. Um, so just uh, uh, to summarize uh, um, this work on wi with white flies, uh, we, we really started from looking on, or looking on, on uh, white fly anatomy and then uh, uh, we, we came through uh, looking at the endosymbionts in white flies, uh, looking for different proteins. I showed you two examples of proteins that are involved in virus transmission, but we know this is uh, more or less an updated image uh, of what's happening regarding uh, virus transmission. And we, today we know that those works were done by us and others. And uh, today we know, uh, 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 enough amount of enough number of proteins that are involved in, uh, in virus transmission. Some of them were even targeted by uh, different approaches and, and showed that uh, those proteins are, in, are important in virus transmission. And the idea is how we can employ this knowledge in, 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 in interfering with the transmission. Um, uh, Patricia, uh, should I stop here? Because the other part is related to uh, rickettsia. Um, and I think uh, we used the time, right? Uh, time is OK. I don't know about your time. But, no, no, um, my time is fine. I just, uh, I just want to be sure I'm, I'm OK with time. You are. <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> OK, so I will try to, uh, to do it uh, quick with, with silids. I just wanted to. Uh, show the other system we work with, and this is this system has been we we've been we've been working with this uh, about eight nine years ago now. And as I, I mentioned at the beginning, we in Israel we have uh, uh, this uh, carrot yellowing disease, and it's caused by Liberibacter solanaceum, and it is a bacterium. It's a fastidious bacterium that we cannot grow really outside of the plant or the psyllid. Uh, but it's transmitted by the carrot psyllid, and it causes it's really a very important disease in Israel, and it's found all over Europe and many other countries. But the most important, uh, really, uh, disease uh, caused by other Liberibacter species is, uh, is uh, uh, citrus greening. I know in, in Brazil is important, in China, in the U.S., really very important. And it, it, the, uh, the, the, this other Liberibacter species, Liberibacter asiaticus, is transmitted by the Asian citrus psyllid. By the way, it was discovered about a year ago in Israel, but with now without the bacteria now. So we might be able also to start working with this. Uh, uh, but the, the, our interest in, in, in this system uh, came because uh, we are interested in circulative transmission of pathogens. So this is the Asian citrus psyllid, and this is more or less the internal anatomy. And you can see again that those bacteria are flowing limited and they are taken by the psyllid to the, the gut. So the gut looks like this in psyllid and there is a hindgut 
and the bacteria reaches the gut and it crosses to the hemolymph, goes back to the salivary glands. And this is how, and then from the salivary glands, they are injected into the plant flow. And this is a fish image showing the localization of liberi bacteria in, in the flowing. Now, the, one of the things, uh, you know, the first things we uh, start doing when we looked at this uh, uh, image, uh, looked at this system is basically how liberi bacteria is localizing in the gut. And when we do, did the, those first experiments, you can see that, so liberi bacteria is in, here in, is in uh, red, and this is Liberibacter asiaticus the, the, that causes the citrus greening. This work was done in, in, uh, in uh, Michel Sidia's lab in, the, in Cornell University. And, and you can see that uh, Liberibacter is really uh, colonizing the whole gut. And, but one of the interesting things we noticed that the gut doesn't look really normal. And uh, <clears throat> the, structure <clears throat> the structure is really weird. And when we, when we started looking at guts, you know, just by structure, not even localizing the liberi bacteria, you can see the difference. So on the right, you can see a, a gut infected with liberi bacteria, and on the, right, on the left, the gut not, not infected with liberi bacteria. You can see the difference. And you wonder how those cellids can survive with such a really missed, missed uh, gut. Uh, so on one hand, the uh, liberi bacteria wants to be transmitted to other plants, but on the other hand, uh, we don't think the uh, liberi bacteria wants to kill the psyllid. So there is a really a cross uh, talk between, uh, um, you know, there is a, a kind of a control of liberi bacteria of what's going on in the gut. And we assume that also the, the psyllid is uh, counteracting against uh, this infection in, in its gut. So. So the, the, the other observations, what you can see in the, those, so here the nuclei are, are in, in blue. They are stained with daphne. You can see how the nuclei are really disintegrating when, they are, when the gut is infected with the bacterium. And this was, uh, this was an indication of that there is a, a cell death or programmed cell death is going on in the, in the gut. So it seems that the psyllid is activating uh, immune responses that they gain the bacterium. And I remind you, this is how the healthy gut or an uninfected gut looks like. So you can see the difference in the, and, and, and also you can see the differences if you do transmission electron microscopy. You can see on the left, this is a normal nuclei and see how nice is it. But on the right, you can see this one is infected with CLAS, asiaticus that causes the greening. This one is a gut of uh, the carrot psyllid in Israel infected with the uh, the other uh, liberi bacteria species are also causes uh, uh, effects on the on the gut cells. But one of the really uh, interesting and this is what really uh, afterwards drove us to do many other uh, things with uh, this uh, those systems is uh, how the when we do, did those sections uh, or EM sections we could see that the ER the endoplasmic reticulum in the uh, gut cells is really forming very nice uh, structured, uh, we call them later vacuoles. And it turns out that those vacuoles are induced after a liberi bacteria infection. As you can see here, they are, they are causing, and we call them liberi bacteria containing vacuoles because later on when we did the more uh, sections, you can see that those membranes are formed by the uh, ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and if you look inside, you can see those liberibacter cells inside. So we think, and this is not new, this is known from other uh, bacterial, even human uh, bacterial species that cause uh, different diseases, that they use the ER as a site where they can replicate. So they, they, they basically use the ER to, to, to build these uh, vacuoles and then replicate inside. And again, you can see here these vacuoles. If we do, this is ER tracker, which is a, a marker that we can stay in ER. And you can see these vacuoles are here. And inside, you can see Liberi bacter. And this is in both systems, the CLAS, uh, the greening system, and the carrot system in Israel. In both cases, we can see uh, uh, vacuoles formed. Now, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, thinking about the ER is one of the most really interesting uh, uh, organelles found in the cell. And in the ER, you know that 
uh, proteins are synthesized there. But uh, the ER is uh, really one of the uh, very active organelle in the cell. And whenever there is stress on the cell, there is also ER stress. And if there is an ER stress, the cell will always respond depending on the kind of stress. And you can see that. So this is the ER site, the ER lumen here, and this is the cellular cytosol here. So you can see when there is an ER stress, there are different responses activated. It depends if whether this is a heat stress or whether there is a you know, viral infection or bacterial infection. And one of those pathways will be activated or more uh, to respond to this stress. And it turns out also that Liberibacter is really involved in the activation of some of these pathways. So we have different projects now looking at, uh, for example, calcium signaling. This is a work that was uh, published recently. We have another work that looking at the ERAD. The ERAD is the ER uh, associated uh, degradation. And this is a mechanism by which uh, unfolded proteins as a response of the stress are taken from the ER outside to the cytosol, and they are degraded there by ubiquitation. So uh, we know that uh, Liberibacter interacts with a, a major protein here called Darley. And uh, um, the, we, we think that uh, this mechanism is activated to basically uh, shuttle outside maybe uh, bacterial proteins and degrade them. And this is a kind of a few immune response. I don't know, we, 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 I have also a, a, another student working on the UPR, it's an unfolded protein response. This is a response. This is another response to, to the infection with the Liberi bacter. And we use here really different uh, techniques and approaches and methods. Uh, you can see here some, we, we use uh, many uh, ER uh, uh, stress inducers and we, they use many inhibitors of some of the, the proteins you see here. And you can see all of these arrows here. So uh, we look at the expression of, uh, of the genes here. Uh, we know that autophagy is involved. Autophagy is also kind of an immune response. Uh, so we, we basically, our focus now is uh, on ER and how ER is involved in, uh, in, uh, in the response to a Liberibacter. And we really now understand that Liberibacter is orchestrating the, uh, or trying to uh, uh, control the responses that happens here in the ER, not to lead the, the cell to apoptosis and, and death, but to maintain the cell for its own replication and then uh, later on transmission. Th this is just an example. I, I won't uh, really uh, put uh, time explaining, but. This is the darling, this uh, protein from the ERAD, the ER associated degradation. And you can see that this protein, when uh, the psyllid is infected with the Liberibacter, you can see that it is induced. So this is the uh, localization of the bacteria. And this is localization of the protein. So those approaches can also be used. Those fish and immunolocalization approaches can be used to localize also uh, candidate proteins that you are interested in. And when we, uh, when, when we do co-localization with of, uh, the bacteria with the, with the, so this is Darlin, this is a bacteria, and this is the co-localization. You can see that Darlin is co very nicely co-localizing in the gut in this uh, stripe-like uh, pattern. And we do, when we do uh, silencing of Darlin, you can see that the co-localization is completely abolished and this affects very much also the transmission of the bacteria. So we know that ERAD is an important mechanism that responds. And if we uh, silence a key a protein in this, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this response, we also affect the transmission. And uh, we know, I told you that uh, one of the uh, responses is apoptosis. And you can see here the, those guts uh, dissected from um, uh, the carrot cell. Then you can see that uh, those, this blackening of cells or nuclei. This is one of the responses we always see when the guts are infected with Liberibacter. So this is also to visualize the real effect on, on the guts. And, and, and lastly, I just want to mention that we do many other uh, 
studies on these interactions. This, this study, these two studies that I'm showing here, one they were uh, published lately. If you are interested, there more. Uh, so this is uh, the immune response uh, and the involvement of, of autophagy in the response to Liberibacter. And again, we we use uh, all these uh, different imaging and localization techniques to uh, show that the bacterium is inducing uh, immune responses and inducing lysosomes, inducing uh, autophagy in the gut uh, uh, to protect the gut from the bacterial infection. And the last one, the last example is, uh, uh, we also showed that uh, the actin cytoskeleton is, is basically a very important component of the cell that uh, the bacteria uses to move inside the cell uh, during the transmission. You can see here, this is an important protein in the actin uh, cytoskeletal uh, filament inside the cell. And if we silence this protein, you can see, so this is a control we can, where, you, where you can see how uh, the bacteria is nicely co-localizing with the, with the actin. But if we silence this, pro, this uh, gene, you can see that the co-localization is, 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 is completely affected. And this also affects the transmission of, of the bacterium. So the different mechanism, different ways to look at, and also, again, using, again, those imaging, uh, you can see that almost every experiment we do, we try to use those uh, imaging uh, methods, uh, and they are always nicer than, you know, doing PCR or, or other molecular uh, ways. Now, I, I just, uh, if I summarize, I, I just want to, I just wanted to put focus on uh, how you can employ and use uh, imaging and localization techniques, you know, diff and, and recent years and maybe the last 20 years, there is an explosion of methods and that you can use uh, with this regard, you know, different molecular probes, uh, almost, you know, almost every gene now or protein you want to work with, there are antibodies and antibodies that cross react even from different species with your species. And uh, it has, I think uh, uh, people now are recognizing more and more uh, those uh, methods. Um, and you always need to look and, uh, you know, do microscopy before, I think, before uh, doing many other things. Um, and, and, I, and I, you know, all the things I described were done by many, many people in my lab and other labs, uh, collaborators. I don't have all the names, but I try to, to try to cite all the, the 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 papers that were published, and the funding comes from different you know sources in Israel and uh, local in Israel or international uh, collaborations with the uh, usually there are binational collaboration with other countries. Um, and thank you. I hope I was not too long. <laughs> Thank you for your listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Thank you so much, Miran. It was amazing, really nice presentation. We already have some questions for you here in the chat. And we also have someone who wants to um, do in the microphone, I guess. So I'm going to go in the order here. Um, Simone asks, um, TYLCV circulates inside the white fly. So is it mm -hmm. possible to localize non-circulative viruses in white flies and aphids as well using these techniques, I guess, is her question. Yes, sure. It, uh, it has been done with, uh, you know, with non-persistent viruses, with the semi-persistent viruses. And uh, we, we actually work uh, now on uh, uh, semi-persistent virus uh, transmitted by, um, by white flies. It's in sweet potato. And uh, yeah, the, those techniques and, you know, fish and immunostaining, you know, if you have good antibodies, uh, you can, uh, uh, and, you know, and those things have been done also by other groups and in other systems. So it's definitely can be done and you get very nice, you know, very nice. Usually the uh, non-persistent or semi-persistent viruses are, uh, will localize to the, you know, the, the, the stylet or the foregut, but, yeah, but yeah, they can be, can be done also. I mean, it's been done in several systems. Cool. So I, I thought someone asked you to, to talk in the microphone, but uh, it's not here anymore. But we have some other questions in the chat. 
So Marcos asked, uh, thank you for the excellent presentation, Dr. Murad. In the Bemisa Tabasi model, is it possible that TYLCV uses the Rickettsia bacterial cell for replication? Uh, uses the Rickettsia for replication? That's the question. If uh, TYLCV uses Rickettsia for Rickettsia cell replication. for replication? Um, uh, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, TYLCV has been shown in just in one case that it accumulates in uh, in white flies. I mean, kind of replicates, but this is the, the, the now the accepted uh, hypothesis is now those bigomo viruses uh, to which TYLCV belongs. Also, they do not replicate. I mean, there is only one case which we showed in which we showed that. You know, if you impose only a stress on the white fly, the white fly, the virus can be accumulated a little bit, but this is not, we don't think it's a real, it can, you can call it replication, but, um, you know, it's not, I don't, we don't think rickettsia is, uh, you know, is uh, related. We don't think uh, there is direct interaction between the virus and rickettsia. We, we never saw direct interaction. Mm -hmm. I think if there, we think if there are any interactions, they are indirect uh, through, you know, through the, uh, through the white fly, through the white fly cell. Okay. Murad, can you stop your presentation so that we can see your camera better? Just... Uh, stop. Uh, yeah, there's a um, bar. Stop sharing. Yeah, uh, yeah. yes, good. <laughs> so one more question here. Uh, Pedro uh, Gonzalez asks, any evidence of ER stress produced by plant viruses in their vectors? Oh, uh, oh plant viruses. Yeah. Um, ER stress, he asks. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I have ever seen uh, such a, an example. Uh, but you know, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah, it doesn't might, there not. might be, you know, <laughs> some examples. I, but you know, from the this TYLCV system, we know that TYLCV, you know, induces many many responses in the white fly. Mm -hmm. But I don't think any of those studies have addressed the involvement of ER. And usually, you know, they they looked at many autophagy was shown to be, you know, responsive to big viruses. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but I don't think, uh, you know, ER was implicated. All right. A any questions, guys? Any more questions here? Someone wants to talk in the microphone or something? Uh, while you guys decide about that, I uh, just want to thank Murad again. And you um, and share with, with everyone here that Murad is coming to Brazil in September. Uh, he's going to spend some days in, in the Santa Senergen, in Grappa Senergen in September. And then after that, he's going to give a presentation in the Brazilian Virology Meeting. Uh, it's going to be very nice to have you here, Murad. We have a lot of things to talk pleasure. about and work together, right? <laughs> so if you guys don't have any more questions, anyone? Last chance. <laughs> okay, so we thank Muraj again. Very nice thank presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone being here. Yeah, and we will see you in September. Yeah, thank you. Around here. <laughs> thank bye you bye. so much. Nice, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Please sign the, the attendance list. <laughs> Who haven't yet? <laughs> I, I go, I leave, okay? Oh, what? I, I can leave? Or? Yes, yes, you're okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you, Murad. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.